I think if I hear you call me Becky one more time, six pack, I'm gonna pop your tops. All six of them. Who are you? This is Matt once again. What about to another review? There's another paid request, this time for Andrew Chilton. Thank you so much for that. If anyone wants to request pretty much any type of video, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box. Again, it will be pretty much anything. And this time we're talking about the 1990 film Loose Cannons, which I don't I know I don't have the DVD taste, but at least got the DVD itself. I don't think this film has gotten a Blu-ray. It probably won't get one because this is a pretty hated film. I'm in the minority and enjoying this movie. I can't remember when I first saw this, but I've... I didn't see it when I was a kid, but definitely saw it, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, give or take. I've always enjoyed it. I don't think it's a perfect movie, but I never thought it was as bad as its reputation, which is considered one of the worst buddy cop films and one of the worst films of the 90s. Dan Aykroyd saying it's one of the worst films he ever did. I'm like, Dan, you did Exit to Fucking Eden. You did Blues Brothers 2000. You were in Christmas with the Cranks. You were in the 2016 Ghost Fuckers movie. Give me a break. It's directed by Bob Clark. Talented director, may he rest in peace. He did the original Black Christmas, Porties, A Christmas Story, Rhinestone with Sylvester Stallone. And he didn't do a lot of like action or action comedies. But this was, I guess, I thought it was a fun movie. It's an interesting idea. Has some very quirky. See, that's why I like the film. Not only because I really enjoy Gene Hackman. He's one of the main reasons why I enjoy Gene Hackman. I'm a big fan of. I'll, I'll talk to him and talk about him in a bit. But there's enough weird, off the wall stuff in this that makes it unique compared to other buddy cop films, which is a dime a dozen. And granted, I'm a sucker for buddy cop movies. Forty Eight Hours, Take One Cash, Bad Boys, Running Steer with Billy Crystal and Gregory Hines, Fifty Fifty with Peter Weller. Well, they're not really cops, but, you know, it's a buddy movie. But, yeah, I like that kind of stuff. As cliche as it can be. But this one with the the opening alone. Bob, Bob Clark took his... What's the word I'm looking for? His experience doing horror films and created... He created kind of a creepy opening with this dumb DeLuise, who worked with Burt Reynolds a lot, and I remember him in Candid Camera decades ago. May he rest in peace. Him and a group of people on a boat, and they come across these guys who are the bad guys, led by Paul Coslow, who I remember he was the bad guy in Robot Jocks, among others. And these bad guys are on a boat, and 
it's misty and foggy and you have this red glow red lights and the villains like hey where are you you're looking for your buddy and the guy has a fishing pole he puts it up as a fucking head on the end of the fishing pole and this is how the this buddy cop movie starts and i know sometimes like wow that's really really fucking weird tone shift but this one it, it kind of worked for me i thought it was just well made the way bob clark did that i'm like okay that's an interesting way to start the movie off i'm like holy shit and then we're you know some of the characters escape some don't and then we're introduced to Gene Hackman's character. Now, I thought he was a lot of fun in this. Most of the laughs I got is from Gene Hackman's character. It's kind of like Due Date, where most of the laughs I got was from Robert Downey Jr.'s character. Not so much as that, Galifianakis. Same with Tyr. I could deal with Dan Acker more than Zach Galifianakis, to be fair. And I think... Dan Aykroyd actually worked better when he was less zany. But most of the laughs I got was from Gene Hackman's reaction, his dialogue, the way he would just react to what the hell was going on. Um, quite a few of it made me laugh because they seem legitimate. And Gene Hackman is one of my favorite actors. He's up there with you know, Sylvester Stallone, James Woods, Brad Dourif, you know, and others. Because I've never seen the guy give a bad performance, whether it be The Birdcage, Narrow Margin, Uncommon Valor, Let's Luther in the Superman movies, uh, of course, The French Connection. I even like The French Connection too. I even like that even more than the first one. I know, but I don't mind the first film. Even if the film, I'm like, eh, I still like his performance. Uh, other films I enjoy. I mentioned Narrow Margin, Mississippi Burning, Enemy of the State with Will Smith. It's sad that he's retired, but I can understand. And again, just always enjoyed his acting. Even, you know, the coach and the replacements with Keanu Reeves, which I haven't seen in a while. I just, I think he did a wonderful job here. And it seemed like Gene knew he wanted to have fun like he, got, he did serious cop movies like The French Connection. This was a chance for him to be more lighthearted, lighthearted and comedic and have a little fun with that type of stuff. Which is interesting. One of the rumors, one of the rumors I heard was that there was going to be a French Connection 3 with him and Richard Pryor. And that didn't work and that's what led to 48 Hours. I don't know if that's true, but that's one of the rumors I heard. So I do wonder if that's one of the things, if it is true, Gene Hackman's like, man, I missed out on that. You know, missed out on 48 hours. Now, 40 hours, that's way better than this movie, but Gene Hackman did a great job. I I liked his look with the Washington Redskin coat. I love a lot of his dialogue. And what's interesting is when we first see him, he's with another partner played by David Alan Greer. David Alan Greer... He worked with Damon Wayans in, in the movie called Blank Man. He was on In Living Color, the sketch TV show by Keenan, Keenan Ivory Wayans. And David Allen Greer, he was in the Pauly Shore film In the Army Now. Funny enough, they also had Andy Dick. And the funny thing about that is if you, get, if you see like the actual DVD cover of this, there's a guy in an ambulance and it's Andy Dick who's a comedian, and he's been in other TV shows and movies, as well as being in the Army now with Paulie Shore and David Allen Greer, and Andy Dick is not in the movie, just in some promotion. Man, it's weird. But, David Allen Greer is the partner, and then he disappears with no explanation. I thought that was really weird. I don't know if there's something cut out, Part of me kind of wishes David Allen Greer was the Dan Aykroyd role. And Dan Aykroyd, I'll get to him. He's he's kind of one of my weak points in the film for me. 
when he tries it. Tis the the jumping ahead. Gene Hackman will partner up with Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd's character has multiple personality. He has multiple personality because at one point he went undercover in narcotics and he was tortured. After being tortured for days, he came out of it where he would act out these personalities. Since then, he was in a monastery. He's been told that he's okay. He can come back to police duty. But obviously he's not because of violence and other stuff. If that occurs, one of these personalities would come up. So then you have Dan Aykroyd either being Dirty Harry or the tower, Cowardly Lion or Captain Kirk during a car chase. And some of that I'm fine with. Like the Captain Kirk car chase scene got me some chuckles, but you know, I'm old school Star Trek fan. Others, they were just irritating. Like the Cowardly Lion. Or there's a point where him and Gene Hackman and Dom DeLuise, the three of them, they, 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 they get together, they're going through the river and... You just have Dak or go, I'm popped by the sailor man. We're rolling, rolling on the river. It's like, we can't just let the scene play. Dan, just say something funny. But it wasn't really funny. It's like, just have nothing. So, and Dan Aykroyd, I don't mind him. I like Dan Aykroyd. But I do think he plays better like he did in Ghostbusters. He plays better, like, in the non-zany stuff in this movie. Like, when it's just him, and he's talking with Gene Hackman, and they're having some sincere conversations where Gene Hackman's like, Hey, I did it. You know, there's a passage. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. And you're afraid your life's going to shut off. And that should piss you off. And like, you know, they're sharing sincere moments. Dan Aykroyd does a good job in those scenes. It's just when... I don't think Dan works in zaniness. I'm sorry. Again, when I look at his best roles, even Blues Bros 2000, he's subdued. Along with Belushi. Like, Belushi's a little bit more zany, it seems, than Dan, Dan Aykroyd in that movie. I think Ghostbusters... Dan works in that. Here, I didn't the when Dan's when Dan is zany, that's when you get the troubles. Like Caddyshack two. One of his worst performances. And so I think Dan Aykroyd he has a rhythm to him that works and doesn't work, and that's kind of fighting in itself in here. And go back to David Allen Greer, I think he would have been an even more interesting choice. For that role. Maybe he's not the bigger name. Dan Aykroyd. Again at this point at Ghostbusters. And all this other stuff. Spies like us. But uh, David Allen Greer. I, it's like, I think he could pull it off. I think he would be funnier. Because I've seen him do zany stuff. Like in the army now. In Living Color. I know David Allen Greer. He would work better in the zany comedy. Which is what this role requires. And I just think Dan half the time he works, half the time he's the wrong choice. Or if you had Robin Williams, holy shit. I just thought of that. If Robin Williams and Gene Hackman, which is funny because they worked together in, later in the birdcage, Robin Williams would have been perfect with how he could go off on these characters and then to see him in a buddy cop action movie with Gene Hackman... I think that would have been the tipping point. That would have been... Because I think Robin Williams could work with the comedy and his improvisational skills. Just watch interviews with how off Robin Williams can get. Just create all this manic energy. And obviously he had to work with Gene Hackerman because they did in The Birdcage years later. Man, Robin Williams would have worked perfectly in this. He would have been a much better choice than Dan Aykroyd. But I still like the film. Like Even with Gene Hackman and David Allen Greer, there, a noise complaint. It's pretty much a couple that keep fucking and keep being loud fucking. And then Gene Hackman, it's nice to see him play a different kind of role where, what do I do, what do I do? Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to ask you to cease and desist until you get a condom. You serious? 
It's the 90s. We're serious about safe sex. It's for your safety as well as ours. And being a fan of Gene Hackman, seeing him play in this light comedic world, but still R-rated, uh, that was a nice change of pace for, for Mr. Hackman. Yeah, that's how much I respect him. I give him the Mr. I thought Bob Clark handled the action fairly well, too. Like there's a bit where there's a chase where the bad guys have a bazooka and the car swerves and a nice effect where the bazooka, you see it shoot out and by right, bypass right by them and blow up a car nearby. And the way that's edited and shot, fairly decent. And then Gene Abman gets like an old antique gun. He's able to fire and fucks up the front of the car and it swerves. Again, it's not fucking John Woo. You know, True Lies. It's not John Wick. But for what it is, it worked well. It was simple, but it was effective for what it had to be. And like I said, when I followed Gene Hackerman throughout, he got the laughs out of me. Like, he's, uh, he has no place to live, so he's living in his car, and a cop comes by to wake him up. And he, the guy's being a wise, is going, nice place, you decorate yourself. And Hackerman just looks at him and goes, fuck you. <laughs> like, a very natural reaction to it. Or when he gets to the crime scene from the beginning of the film, and there's the, the captain... And then there's Dan Aykroyd, and Dad Aykroyd is doing all this stuff, and Gene Hatton's like, what the hell's he doing? Oh yeah, it's inspiring to see him work. And then when he sees Dan look at a body and pull the pants down, it's to look at evidence, but Gene Hatton's looking at this go, oh God, say, hey, somebody call a cop. <laughs> I did just, as someone said it best, when you see an actor seem like he's having a lot of fun, it becomes infectious, and so I'm having fun. And like Dan Aykroyd is pointing at it and says, what do you see? And then Hackman's like, I see a crotch. I don't much like it. <laughs> Again, he, he was the MVP, Gene Hackman. He was a lot of fun. And like I said, when Dan, at this point, he, when he's normal, he's fine. He's fine. It's when he gets into these personalities, which is supposed to be the crutch of the movie of the laughs, and those are the least funny parts. It's the Gene Hackman's reaction that are the funny parts to me. So when you get to this S&M club, and these personalities come out, and he's acting like the cowardly lion, pull him up, pull him up, boys riding around, humming the Lone Ranger theme. I'm like, oh, brother... And that's what I mean, like, this is a weird movie. It's one of the weirder buddy cop films when you look at the plot. I mean, this is a buddy cop film, but it's got S&M clubs, and the plot is to find a film that's a skin flick, sex flick with Adolf Hitler, which the bad guys want because it has this guy running for chancellor in Germany, and... Shows that he was with Hitler back in the day. Along with his other people. When the guy denies he was part of the, the Nazi party. Where he was. And then Dumb DeLuise. Wanted to buy the flick. Because he's a porno director. But then he realizes. The error of his ways. And joins our two leads. And I like Dumb DeLuise. It's always nice to see him in there. It was cool to see him R rated. He did to throw the F bomb a few times. And. He was having fun with his role as well. It's like, okay, it's like Dumb DeLuise got to do something a bit different. And, you know, got to fire a gun. He got to fire a machine gun. The fuck with the wrong Jew this time. <laughs> oh, yeah, I miss Dumb DeLuise. Uh, he was entertaining in this. Um, I mentioned after that there's a, a car chase scene. That's when... At first, Dan Aykroyd's being nice and polite. And then just Gene Hatcher's reaction. Are oh, you shitting me? This is not driver's ed. Step on the gas, man. 
and then he turns into Captain Kirk. And that I could deal with. Plus, you know, the car chase was filmed fine. It wasn't shaky cam. It wasn't confusing editing where it's up close and may be so discombobulated. I don't understand the environment. I do. It's all done practically. There's not in the days of off the cuff weird CGI that takes you out of the movie. De- Again, it's not fucking James Bond movie, but it's decent. Decently shot car chase. And then Gene Hackman's trying to figure out what to do. I'm Mr. Spock. Captain Kirk, I believe you are your command. <laughs> and Dumb Dumb like, that's the best you could do? Be Mr. Spock? <laughs> and that's what I mean. It, it, there's a lot of comedy for me that works, other than when the more zanier Dan Aykroyd points. I mean, if you had David Allen Greer or Robin Williams, I think that would work a lot better. And I even didn't mind the backstory of Dan Aykroyd's character, where I thought, wow, that's a really sad backstory. I thought Dan Aykroyd, when he plays those parts where he's afraid of being lost forever, he was more effective in that. And what's... Something I always thought of, too, is when the captain is explaining this circum- these circumstances to Gene Hackman's character about how the narcotic guys, they got him and drugged him and tortured him, and the captain says, you know what? Could have been you one of those days. Could have been you. And he's like, yeah, I know. The reason that sticks out to me is that it reminds me something similar happened to him in the French Connection too. <laughs> Not the multiple personality thing, but narcotic guys got Popeye Doyle. They drugged him up and fucked with him. And then he had to escape. And then they had to, he had to detox himself cold turkey. Not the exact same, but the first connection too popped up. I don't seem random, but those are. I say yeah, and in life, that's what you went through. And there's other recognizable people. There's Nancy Travis. She appears. She was in Three Men and a Baby. She was in. Was it Doc Hollywood with Michael J. Fox? That she was in. She's one of the good guys trying to get the film. Ronnie Cox from Robocop and Total Recall. He appears as, I think, FBI. Who you think he's trying to help. But he's just being an asshole. Uh, Robert Prosty is the chancellor for Germany. That he's on the, the Hitler film. Robert Prosty, he was in John Carpenter's Christine uh, he was in Stallone's film, I See You. He's a guy in Last Hatching Hero who gives the golden ticket to the boy. That's Robert Prosty. Tobin Bell, Jigsaw from the Saw films. He makes a little tiny appearance as a guy working with Robert Prosty. I'm like, oh shit, is that... Yeah, that's Tobin Bell. He's in like one scene. and But it's oh, nice to see him. Like, oh, I recognize you. Again, I keep harping on Gene Hackman's reaction. Like, he doesn't have a place to stay, and Dan's like, you just stay with me. And everywhere is white. <laughs> like, all the rooms, everything is white. So while he stays the night, uh, Dan, he even warns that, you know, sometimes I have these fits at night. And so in the middle of the night, he starts streaming, and Gene Hackman listens, and then he immediately puts the dresser in front of it, and he even pulls out his gun. And then when he goes back to bed, he's like, Good night, everybody. I just... I, I think because Gene Hatton's reaction, I could relate to because I could see myself having the exact same reaction that Gene had. So I think that's why it, it tickled me so much. And listen, some of the action scenes, like there's a scene in the bathhouse, Dumb DeLuise, one of his business ventures, where they're trying to meet someone... And some of the, the German bad guys are there. And there's a shootout. With some decent bits of slow motion. Again, it's not John Woo. But, you know, nice mix of slow motion. A few squibs here and there. You know, decently shot. It's not the worst I've seen compared to... A ton of movies I can mention from the past 10 years. 
direct to video and some even theatrical, sadly. Another line of dialogue I like, there's a point where Dumb DeLuise hurt on his ass. He's like, I got a hole in my ass. And the doctor's like, yeah, that's why they call you an asshole. <laughs> I won't give everything away for the third act, but... Again, there's a bit in the third act. During the final confrontation, I'll say that. I thought the way it's, it's directed and edited... Uh, gave it a bit of impact. And I thought Bob Clark showed a bit of his talent in this film that's gone a bit underappreciated. Uh, the movie went at a good pace. The song at the end, I can see why people hate it. it it's quirky. The first part of the song was just, I forget her name, the woman that played Peg in Married with Children, and she was also a voice in Futurama. She sings the song. When Dan Aykroyd starts singing it later in the song, yeah, it's pretty bad. I can't understand why people don't like the song at the end from the get-go, but the the beat and her singing is so, I mean, quirky that it's kind of fun. And maybe it's because it's along with the titles and the titles are done in, like, neon even though it's 1990, it just seems 80s. I mean, with the the music tone, it's not one of the. It's not like a song I listen to a lot, and I wouldn't even listen to it by itself. But as a part of the movie, I might. For some reason, I don't mind it. And each time I've seen this, I'll listen to the beginning parts of the song, and then when Dan Aykroyd has "No the Fire," but what the fuck he's doing? No. What the fuck he's doing? Then I, I stop it. But yeah, Loose Cannons, like I said, has a quirky plot. Again, how many buddy cop films deal with a film canister that has a Nazi skin foot porn flick with Hitler in it that also has an important guy in it and the bad guys are looking for that and Dumb DeLuise is a custom porno director and, you know, Gene Hackman's having fun. It's a very different type of buddy cop film. And I I appreciate that in this day and age where a lot of buddy cop films are typical. And I wouldn't say this is cliche, like some critics make it out to be. I don't think this is a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. Give me a fucking break. I mean, right along, one and two, I got this many laughs out of compared to this. Loose Cannons has better directed action scenes, and I'm sorry, I got more laughs out of this than any of the Ride Along movies. No, it's not up there with Bad Boys 1, 2, and 3. It's not up there with 48 Hours or... I'd probably put another 40 Hours above it. It's, you know, Kingdom and Cash I put above it. Even, you know, buddy films like I Come in Peace, Split Second. But... On the list of underrated... Yeah, I, I would say it's underrated. I don't think it's nearly as bad as people make it out to be. Fun movie, fun comedy... I just think Dan Aykroyd was probably not the best choice. Again, Robin Williams or or someone else would have been pretty pretty damn interesting. With that said, thanks for watching. Take care. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.